Well, I have the urge to come down there and visit with you, but I'm told that I can only go from this flower to this flower or the camera messes up. That's kind of a restrictive kind of thing, but maybe we'll be able to get through it. Branson, I can hear you singing. Thank you. Anderson, you got a whole row of guys to keep your eyes on this afternoon, all right? We got your numbers, all right? And so we're really hoping you guys are going to be focusing in because someone's coming. And that's our study this afternoon. Someone is coming tells you every book of the Old Testament. Really. I do have a little challenge with Song of Solomon, I will admit. But otherwise, every book of the Old Testament is telling us someone is coming. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those biographers... You know, Jesus didn't write any. We don't get to read anything Jesus wrote. He had to have somebody else to write it. They're telling us someone has come. And the rest of the New Testament is telling us someone's coming back. Someone's coming again. If you're at the Bible school, you can get an A on the test. Okay? Someone is coming. Someone has come. And someone's coming back. That's, that's all you need to know. So now I've presented a thesis. That's what they'd call it at school, wouldn't they, Nathan? I've presented a thesis. Now I need to go back and see if I can shore that up and prove it to you. Delighted to see you. Really glad you've come. Marion Street boys, they can deck it up. Boy, when you hear Warren and Lax and Luke and, and McLean and all those guys, they're really, I really appreciate you guys jumping in there in worship. They're never too young to begin worshiping God. I stand in awe of him. I have this image in the Peconia's front yard. We're worshiping. We've got kids from Athens and, and Decatur and, and Hartzell and Huntsville and Birmingham. And one of the Huntsville boys is leading. I stand in awe of him. Or no, he was in the audience. And when we started singing that, guess what all the kids did? They stood up. I stand in awe of him. Beautiful, beautiful reminders. And we're going to see Jesus throughout the whole study. Jesus created everything. Colossians 1 makes that point. And so we're going to watch him lead us to himself together this afternoon. I may not stay real close with my notes, but you'll be able to stay with the points about God's family, God's family relationships. That's what it's about. God wants a relationship with you and with me. So we're going to walk through from creation to revelation these slides, these pictures were presented by a friend of mine. And um, if you want to know more, ask my wife, Cindy. Just Google creation to revelation. You'll learn a whole lot of information about those 17 periods of Bible history that Bob Waldron tried to teach us about 50 years ago. It's just a little bit newer format as we walk through these pictures. So there was Adam and Eve before the flood. Okay, Period number one, before the flood. And we're noticing then that Adam and Eve are made in the image of God. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. And then there was their boys, Cain and Abel. Sin's already entered the world. The, the sneaky snake has already deceived Eve and, and Adam has gone along with it. And now Cain is jealous because Abel's sacrifice by faith is accepted by God and his offering is not accepted. And so 1 John 3 verse 12 tells us that Cain was jealous and decided to murder his brother. So things are, things are getting bad on the earth. This beautiful, pristine garden in Eden that God made for Adam and Eve to enjoy. God had given Adam work, which was a privilege, not a punishment. He'd given him this woman, Eve, to help complement him in every way. And now they have been duped by the devil and Cain and Abel. Abel's dead. And Cain's a murderer. So through which son of Adam and Eve did Jesus come? It's not Abel, he's dead. Cain's a bad guy. And I'm going to try not to get you to say it out loud, but you can go ahead and mouth it. You can say, Seth. Seth Allen, that's the one. And by the way, if your kids walk out of here calling me alligator, it's okay. I've already told the Richter kids, that's what I'm known as, so I'm just alligator. And, and that's easy for them to remember. But Seth is who you really want to remember. Okay, Adam and then Seth. We're watching for the descendants of Seth. But we get to where things are really, really bad. I mean, the thoughts of people is only evil continually. Now, where you go to school, it's pretty bad, right? It's not, not good where you go to school. I'm not bashing any particular school. 
But things are bad. But it's not as bad as it was when Noah's boys went to school. The thoughts of people were evil continually. And can you imagine what everybody's saying about crazy old Noah? Crazy old Noah. He's got his boys out there building this big boat. He says there's going to be a flood. He says there's going to be rain. We haven't seen any rain. What do you mean a flood? But by faith, Noah built an ark. You know, he got his boys on the ark. I'd say he's quite a preacher. 2 Peter 2 talked about him being a preacher of righteousness. How many people did he bring? David, you've got three boys. How many people did, did he bring to the Lord on all that preaching? Let's say he preached for 100 years. Well, he got his boys on the boat and he got his boys' wives on the boat. Now, it wasn't Noah that saved them. It was God's grace that saved them. But Noah did his job at home. You want to be a preacher? Build your boat at home. So Noah is going to trust God even when he hasn't seen and God's going to come to the rescue. God's going to redeem him. God's going to rescue him and his family. Great opportunities now. Now that he's gotten off the boat, we're going to just spread out. We're going to multiply. We're going to replenish the earth. That's what God tells him to do. And people, rather than listening to God, said, no, we want to make a name for ourselves. We're going to be the tower. We're going to make a tower to heaven. And it comes to be a bunch of babel. And as you've traveled internationally and you've heard all these foreign languages, that's what it sounds like to you still today. And yet someone brought out to me, I think it was Marion Street, maybe last Sunday. Yeah, right, it was, it was Joe. All these foreign languages that you read about in Genesis, guess what foreign languages you read about in Acts chapter... Two, here are all these people who can't communicate with each other. And now on Pentecost, through the work of the Holy Spirit, the message of God's redemption, the rescue plan, is announced by these different apostles speaking in the languages of the people, and they can all hear, and now they can be rescued. Isn't it neat how God ties things together? And as we notice then, the people are scattered, and so they're going all over the world, and they're speaking lots of different languages. But God's looking for somebody who will trust Him, somebody who will follow Him. He's looking for some fathers who will share with their families not only the sacrifices, the worship of God, but the promises of God. And so Abram, later called Abraham, the father of the multitude, is told about a land. He's told about a great nation from his descendants. And he's told that in your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now that's compiling Genesis 12, 15, 17, and 22. And so Abraham is trusting God. Not perfectly. He doesn't always do what's right. He doesn't always say what's right. He sure doesn't say the true things about his wife sometimes. But for the most part, Abraham is a man of faith. And you can see littered all over the land, the rock piles where he's been worshiping God. What would your kids see where you've been worshiping? And so here's a man of faith. And then he has a son by faith. His first son, Ishmael, not by faith. Isaac, by faith. And God calls on him to sacrifice Isaac. And he, by faith, is going to do what God says. And God rescues him and rescues Isaac. And then Isaac's going to have two boys. They're twins. There's Esau, who's the oldest, and then Jacob. And Jacob is a trickster. He's a deceiver. He's not always trusting God. And Esau is not making good choices either. And his wives are not helping things. But yet God has made promises through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob is the Israel. Jacob is the prince of the nations. And then who do you think that last guy is in the picture? The, the uh, different colored coat guy. You already know, don't you? We say, that's Joseph. Well, of course it's Joseph. Did Jesus come from Joseph? <laughs> he couldn't help. No. No, he didn't come. But you would think he would. Joseph was a really good guy. But it's his older brother Judah through whom Jesus would come because the ruler's staff would not depart from Judah. Remember Genesis 49 and verse 10? Until Shiloh come. And so Judah's going to be the one through whom the, the promises would come, but Joseph is the one who rescues his family. Joseph is the one who gets his family down to Egypt so they don't starve to death. And so Joseph is a very good man who trusts God. So that's the patriarch period. 
Then after that period, we find the people down in Egypt. And God says, I'm going to get you out of Egypt. In fact, God told Abraham about Egypt. 400 years later, I'm going to bring my people out. And so now is the time, and God uses Moses drawn out of the water to rescue the people of God from a terrible taskmaster, Pharaoh. And so the people are going to get to come out of Egypt, but they've got to cross something. They've got to, by faith, go across the Red Sea. And they cross the Red Sea on dry ground. And so God rescues them, but they've got to act by faith and, and go right through that water with those walls of water. They've got to go across on the Red Sea. And so let's see now. We're thinking about people getting rescued and, and water being involved. What, what would have to have to do with anything? Well, God wants a special people. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So God wants a family. God wants a special family. God had Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, but now we've got millions of people that God wants as His very special treasured possession. They're priests, a holy nation of priests. God wants them to all be His people. He wants to be their father and rescue them. But this water thing, this going through the water, Red Sea, they went through the water. Did they ever go through the water again? Well, yeah, they did. There was the Jordan at flood stage. And, and, and they're going to have to, by faith, trust God. And, and God's going to mound up that water. And then they're going to take those 12 stones from the priest. And they're going to put them over on the other side once they get through. the. So God's using water, almost like a dividing line. You know, the water was critical with, with Moses. And the water was critical with Noah. And then you have other instances where people are seriously hurt. Bad diseases like leprosy, Naaman, the Syrian. And, and God says, you need to go, and you need to go to the, the prophet. And he says, you need to wash, what was it, seven times? In that dirty old Jordan River. And Naaman doesn't want to do that, but somebody talks some sense into him. And God rescues people with water. And he takes them from being slaves... To free. He takes them from being people who are going to drown or people who are going to live. He takes them from being leprous to cleansed. Something about that. You just kind of see a pattern in our spiritual heritage. You'll see that pattern. And so as we keep on going then, they're rescued through the water. Water doesn't save any of them. But the water is an instrument by which God saves them and God rescues them. And if you're thinking about and your friends are saying, wait a second, you guys are just te teaching water baptism. You think that the salvation is in the water. No, we don't. Colossians 2 is very clear about that. Our faith is in the power of God. God's working with our obedience, but it's by His grace and mercy. We don't trust in the water. And by the way, we don't trust in the preacher either. We trust in the God who saves us. And when He says go through the water, you know what obedient children do? Go through the water. Whether it's a burial in water, whether it's walking through on dry ground, whether it's building a boat, or whether it's dipping in the River Jordan. And so you see that connection in 1 Corinthians 10. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. You see who was on the scene in the days of Moses? They drank from Jesus. Jesus was leading them through the wilderness. Jesus was leading the rescue mission. And of course we have also observed Jesus was leading Naaman to be cleansed. Then we've got this wandering in the wilderness. Moms, you can relate. You got little kids? Nancy Tumlinson, who was helping with our spiritual heritage, said every mother knows about wandering in the wilderness because you're chasing your kids all over the house. And in moms, if you want to be found, just go to the bathroom. They will find you. They're wandering in the wilderness 
really for about 38 years. The first year, they're going there to Mount Sinai. God says, look, we've got to get some information here. You need to know how to build this tabernacle. If I'm going to be dwell among you, you need to be holy people. I've got to have holy priest. And we need to get ready for army. We need to get ready for war. So we need to do some numbering of the people. See, we've just covered Le Leviticus and Numbers. We need to number everybody so when we go in to exterminate the enemies, which I told you about 400 years ago, we need to do this the way I tell you. And so they're wandering in the wilderness getting ready. You talk about boot camp. This was a long one. Because the fathers don't trust God. The fathers don't believe God. And so when you get to about chapter 11 and 12 and 13 of Numbers, they mutiny. They say, no, nope, can't take them. They're all giants, too big. Do you know the only two guys of the 603,000 soldiers, there were only two that came into the promised land? You can't name the 12 spies, can you? Or maybe you can. But the two you can name is Joshua and Caleb. They were men of faith. So you go from 603,000 to 601,000. Only the 601,000 is a whole new generation. And now Moses, as a 120-year-old man, wants to help this next generation to trust God, to love God, to serve God so that you may live. He wants them to choose life. Their dads chose death. It's estimated that every 20 minutes during that period in the wilderness, somebody was dying. Dads were falling like flies because they didn't trust. And their sons are living in a culture of death. And yet Moses is saying, you boys, you choose life. And so some of them do. But in this process of walking through the wilderness, the, the golden calf incident was such a tragedy. Moses is up on the mountain and Aaron has let the people go wild. And now they bow down to worship a golden calf. It was easy to get God's people out of Egypt. But it was not easy to get Egypt out of God's people. And so they're right back in Egypt in the worship of the calf. They're sitting down to eat and rising up to play. And God is going to judge. And so God says, I can't go with you anymore. I'm not going. Moses, you take the people into the land, but I'm not going. He says it this way. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you're a stiff-necked people. You can't be in the presence of a holy God and, and act in unholy ways. It results in death. Just ask Nadab to buy you. And so as we go on in chapter 33, God says, Okay, now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Moses said, God, these are your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. You don't want to go anywhere that God's not going to go. And if God's not going to go with you, you don't need to be going there. And so what God wants for us is to know Him. John 17. Jesus' prayer is that they may know you and that they may know me. And that's our life mission, to know God and to know Jesus. And so Moses says, if you're not going, I'm not going. Go with God. Then Joshua, such a wonderful military, faithful servant leader has to go on after his mentor has just died. How's that going for you? When the person you've loved for 40, 50, 60 years is no longer by your side, you reach over at night and she's not there, how do you keep going? When he's no longer here and you're a widow and you're just wishing, how do you go on? You go by faith, just like Joshua did. And they marched around that city of Jericho 13 times. Six days, once a day, seven times on the seventh day. And God gave them the city 
when the walls came down flat. And their job is to remove people who are idolatrous to the core and are devouring their families, their children with their idolatrous worship. And the iniquity of the Amorite nations is now full and Joshua has to lead the expedition. And he acts by faith. And so does the next generation. He will say, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Guys, I want you to take a check on that. That's a grand thing that he said, and I know he believed it, and it seems that his family did follow. But the only person you can absolutely control as to whether they show up with God or not is you. We can say, our kids are going to serve the Lord. And when they're little, we can get them behind the neck, you know, and kind of twist them a little bit. But there comes a time when your son, your daughter, you know what they're going to do when they get away from home? Exactly what they want to do. They're going to choose. But Joshua is choosing, asking a whole generation, choose. He's saying the same thing Moses did just 40 years later. Choose whom you will serve. Choose life. Don't choose death like your daddy. And those of us who are grandparents, we want to see our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren serving the Lord. And we pray for that every day and we try to teach them. But they choose. We can't make that choice for them. But we can show them the best choice. And so if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, that they served in the region among the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but it's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Let's not just do a cross stitch or a plaque or even a text. Let's really live that. And so now we've got the judges. Aaron, you wanted 2 o'clock Ruth class. Man, we'd all like to do more Ruth class. Ruth is this Moabite young lady who has been impacted by some Jews who have left Bethlehem, and now she's going home loyally to be with her mother-in-law, Naomi. But if you read Judges 17, if you read Judges 21, the Jews were horrific butcherers of women. And you just think about how, how depraved the people became within two to three generations. From, 1100, from, from 1400 to 1100. And the generation after Joshua, they followed God. Judges 2.10. They did what God said. They, they trusted all that generation were gathered to their fathers. But there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that He had done for Israel. By the next generation, generation, they dropped the ball. And guys, I want you to hear that. I remember Bob Waldron making this point probably 40 years ago. If you want to teach your children to love God, they've got to know what God has done. That's what Acts is all about. You've got to know what Jesus has done. You've got to know the actions of God. It's easy to talk character. Character is seen in action. And so young fathers, I implore you, I plead with you, teach your children what God has done. They need to know the facts that their faith may grow. Facts alone will not produce that. But without them, there cannot be faith. And so there's a generation who doesn't know the Lord and they don't know what He's done. So in those days, everybody does what's right in their own eyes. There's no king and everybody's just doing what they want to do. But then there is a kingdom that is united. All the tribes are together. You know who the kings are? One kind of looks kind of sad. I think he might have been smiling at first. Saul, David, Solomon. The kingdoms united with all the tribes working together, sort of, during that time. God's always wanted relationship with His people. He's always desired that. In the Exodus, He wants to be a Father who provides and protects. He said, I will take you to be my people. 
and I'll be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Then in the 600s, and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Ezekiel is going to say the same thing to the captives. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. That is the mantra that is repeated throughout the Old Testament and then is repeated in the New Testament. What does God want? I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. There's also this picture in the Old Testament of another relationship that God wants. And that is God wants us to be his wife. But God wants us to be a faithful wife. He wants us to be a loyal wife. He wants us to be a bride that he can be proud of and that he can know she's always going to be loyal. I can always trust her. That's what God wanted. And God put Hosea through a terrible test. Hosea is told to marry a woman who's a harlot. And then he's got this situation where, okay, this child is mine. But wait a second. This is not my people. This is low Ruham. This, 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 there's no mercy. These kids are not my kids. Now, their mother's been with somebody, but it's not me. And Hosea has to live through that, and he has to take her back when she's on the auction block because that's what God's done with us. We have not behaved well. We've not been loyal. We've not been faithful. We've been a harlotous bride, and yet God says, I'm going to buy you back. You were supposed to be my people, but you've not been living like my people, but I want you to be my people. That is the theme of Scripture. And God knows that the people are going to reject him. And he knows that they're going to want a king. And he says, this is what's got to happen, Deuteronomy 17, when you do have a king. But because they rejected God, they've ended up in captivity. 722, 721, Assyria has swooped down and they've taken the northern tribes. Judah's hanging on by a thread in 605 B.C. Now Nebuchadnezzar has come and now Daniel's taken. See if you can figure out which one's which. Daniel is taken... Ezekiel's by the river, and Jeremiah's back home while the temple is burning. And they're all calling God's people and the nations back to Him. But it's not looking good. And finally, the Chronicle account. Let me make this observation with you. If you ever thought, man, reading the Chronicles is reading Samuel and Kings all over again. No, it's not. There are some similar historical events... But the chronicler is taking a very different perspective from the standpoint of the priest and from the standpoint of a holy God. If you don't read the chronicles, you're going to miss out on so much about what was actually going on in the hearts of the people. And so when you get to 2 Chronicles 36, the chronicler, who may well have been Ezra, says, But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising His words and scoffing at His prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people, until there was no remedy. Jeremiah has tried and tried. Ezekiel has tried. Daniel is in the court of the foreign king. And they have rebelled against God until there is no remedy. So captivity is where they will be. But God's Spirit is coming. Coming in a very special way. God's Spirit had directed prophets, priests, and kings. And God's king and kingdom were coming. There were going to be four world empires. There was going to be Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, the head of gold. There was going to be the Medes and the Persians. There was going to be the Greeks. All that is named for you in Daniel chapter 8, by the way. You don't have to guess about who these kingdoms are. And then there's this fourth world kingdom. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will last forever. Food for thought. How long has God been king? How long has God been king? I'm just going to let you chew on that a little bit. I'd like to suggest to you God's always been king. But what he's about to do is in a very special way bring his king and his kingdom into this world in the body of his son. And so the spirit has a lot to do with all of that. All his people is going to receive the gift of the spirit. Joel 2. Isaiah 44 is going to tell us, 
For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Ezekiel's going to remind the people a hundred years later. And I will not hide my face anymore from them when I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. And then there's that Zechariah statement about God's spirit being a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy in Jerusalem so that they would look on me on whom they have pierced They shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. See that Isaiah's period, Ezekiel's period, and now after they've come home to rebuild the temple, Zechariah says, my spirit, mercy, grace. And I want you to think about the temple. You remember when the tabernacle was built, God's Shekinah came. The the presence of God was visibly manifested. Nobody could be in the tabernacle when God came in. And then when Solomon builds the temple, the Shekinah comes, the glory of God. Nobody can be in the temple. But when the temple that's built by Zechariah, remember Zerubbabel and Joshua, and when Haggai and Zechariah are saying, you got to get up and build this temple, there's no demonstration of the glory of God. There's no coming down in a cloud filling that temple. So I want you to think about, does God ever come back in His fullness with His Spirit and dwell in His temple ever again? Think carefully. Who is the temple of the Holy Spirit? What does the Spirit do on the day of Pentecost to announce God's rescue, God's redemption, God's salvation to all men. And the people who believe that they are the murderers of Jesus say, what must we do? We've killed our Messiah. And they're told to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's all kinds of ways to think about that. But that's what the Spirit said about Himself. And so we've got all those years between Malachi and Matthew. God's working. Lots of things are happening. Kingdoms are coming. And God is, from Galatians 4, bringing His Son at just the right time, born under the law, born of a woman, and born to allow us to be adopted so we can call our Father, dear Father. Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2, Acts 2 brings us to the Messiah, to the Anointed One. Isaiah 35 had had told us that the blind are going to be able to see, the lame are going to walk, the deaf will hear, the dead will be raised up. And Isaiah 61, the poor will have the gospel preached to them. Here He is. Here is God in the flesh. God has visited His people He's going to come as a king, but he's a servant king, so different. So Isaiah 53, which was read this morning, he's going to be a servant king. And the Spirit's going to dwell in him, and he's going to direct his path, Matthew 4. And he's going to send that Spirit upon those who would submit to his regal reign as king. And so John 7, when he's at those waters, whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about his, the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus is giving very special directions. John 14, John 15, John 16, and the prayer in John 17 is with the apostles. Always read context. Read Matthew, read Luke. Know who he's talking to. So many people are confused about who is going to be guided into all the truth. Jesus is choosing official representatives. But then we have the Pentecost. We have the Feast of Ingathering. We have the gathering of the grain, the barley, and later of the wheat. And we have God bringing in the sheaves. 
as the apostles are announcing, you killed him, God raised him, he's at the right hand of God. Now will you come and obey your king? And 3,000, 3,000 people that day cut to the heart. Remember we told you this morning, repentance is absolutely essential. Cut to the heart. What do we do? God, God had a plan. He's always had a plan. And the plan is Jesus. And Jesus is king. Think with me. What was established on Pentecost? I know what we're typically taught, and, and that's not far off. What was established on Pentecost? You killed your Messiah. God has put him on the throne. That's what's established based on the Old Testament prophecies and the empty tomb. Christ is Lord and King. The result of that, when people recognize that He's the King, they become His people. And we call that, God calls that, the church. So we come to the King. He rescues us. He redeems us. He delivers us from the domain of darkness. And then He adds us to His family, His one body, His church. Because we've submitted to the rule of King Jesus. That's why the apostles were on it. In Acts 1 and verse 8, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They may have had some misconceptions about how that was going to work, but they knew it was the time of the king and the time of the kingdom. They were asking the right question. And so when Christ returns, all are going to be judged, and the kingdom is going to be delivered back to the Father. And so Christ has defeated Satan. Satan couldn't stop him from having his kingdom. Satan couldn't stop him from having his church. And the king and the kingdom have come. He's on his throne as David had prophesied. The good news of the risen king was shared with a Jerusalem multitude. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you believe that? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you believe that? That's what the Holy Spirit said. But the reason we're hesitant about that is because we know a lot of people don't understand what it means to call on the name of the Lord. What the Holy Spirit does through Peter and the other apostles is explain what calling on the name of the Lord looks like, beginning in about verse 22 of Acts 2. And the Holy Spirit says you've got to understand who the king is, and then you've got to submit to his rule in your life. And if you really believe that he's the king, then you've got to repent and be baptized, every one of you. That's what calling on the name of the Lord looks like. And you can see Saul of Tarsus as a model of that. God calling people through His gospel to become His people. And God, and only God, adds people to His family. The church that belongs to Jesus, the Christ. So this marvelous idea is revealed. And the Holy Spirit is saying, look at this. Have the hearts have the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Not only in this age but in the one to come. And He put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are the body. We are the people of God. Because of what God has done through Jesus, we are the rich inheritors of the gracious blessings found only in Jesus. We should rejoice in that, but we should share it with everyone else who desperately needs the grace and mercy of God in Jesus Christ. God's kingdom. The message is spreading. People are coming to the Lord. And what the Holy Spirit could say to the Corinthians, it's Corinth, right? Used to be. What God could say to the church at Corinth, for we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. So he's going to bring us home. He's going to take us from one garden in Genesis to the other garden 
in Revelation 21. So here's what John sees, this holy city, this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. God created a garden for his people to enjoy his blessings and God has created a garden for all of his people to enjoy his blessings from now through eternity. So the question is, what's my response to the Redeemer? What's my response to the Rescuer? The one who's come to deal a crushing blow to the serpent. Am I in Christ or am I not? And so Galatians points us to the fact that we are clothed with Christ by faith in Him and we're buried with Christ in baptism. We're all in one body. Doesn't matter what your ethnicity may be. In Christ Jesus, you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Not Jew, not Greek, not male, not female, not, not slave or free. You're all one in Christ Jesus. If you're all Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Y'all have listened really well. And it's at Sunday afternoon at nap time, but I didn't hear any snoring. Y'all are very kind. But more importantly, did you see Jesus, my Lord? Did you see him through the woman? Did you see him through Noah, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Did you see him through Moses? Did you see him through the prophets? God has always wanted us to be his people. He's asked us to loyally trust him. And when we do, we get to enjoy all the spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. Now, can't we go invite somebody else to share in those blessings? Tomorrow night, we're going to speak about prejudice. Boy, it sneaks up on us in so many ways. But there is one man in history who knew prejudice more than any of us will ever know it. And that was Jesus, my Lord. So I want you to think about life of prejudice through the eyes of Jesus. If you're not in Christ, God wants to be your father. He wants you to marry him. He wants relationship with you. He wants you to love him. He loves you. And he wants you to go home to be with him. If you've not yet done that, and you know you're not in Christ, now would be a great time to make that good confession as we stand.